I hope you want to know what became of the other boys. They were waiting below to give Wendy time to explain about them. And when they had counted 500, they went up. They went up by the stair because they thought this would make a better impression. They stood in a row in front of Mrs Darling with their hats off and wishing they were not wearing their pirate clothes. They said nothing, but their eyes asked her to have them. They ought to have looked at Mr Darling also. But they forgot about him. Of course, Mrs Darling said at once that she would have them. But Mr Darling was curiously depressed. And they saw that he had considered six a rather large number. I must say, he said to Wendy, that you don't do things by halves. George! Mrs. Darling exclaimed, pained to see her dear one showing himself in such an unfavourable light. Then he burst into tears, and the truth came out. He was as glad to have them as she was. But he thought they should have asked his consent as well as hers. And said he would find space for them all in the drawing room if they fitted in. The boys cried they would fit in. Then follow the leader, mind you. I'm not sure that we have a drawing room, but we have to pretend. And it's all the same. Hoopla! He went off dancing through the house and they all cried. Hoopla! Hoopla! And danced after him, searching for the drawing room. And I forget whether they found it. But at any rate, they found corners and they all fitted in. As for Peter... He saw Wendy once again before he flew away. He did not exactly come to the window, but he brushed against it in passing so that she could open it if she liked and call to him. That is what she did. Hello, Wendy. Goodbye. Oh dear, are you going away? Yes. You don't feel, Peter, that you would like to say anything to my parents about a very sweet subject? No. About me, Peter? No. Mrs Darling came to the window. For at present she was keeping a sharp eye on Wendy. She told Peter that she had adopted all the other boys. And would like to adopt him also. Would you send me to school? Yes. And then to an office? I suppose so. Soon I would be a man? Very soon. I don't want to go to school and learn solemn things, he told her passionately. I don't want to be a man. Oh, Wendy's mother, if I was to wake up and feel there was a beard. Mrs Darling stretched out her arms to him. But he repulsed her. Keep back, lady. No one is going to catch me and make me a man. But where are you going to live? Well, with Tink, in the house we built for Wendy. The fairies have put it up high among the treetops, where they sleep at nights. How lovely! Wendy cried so longingly that Mrs Darling tightened her grip. I thought all the fairies were dead. There are always a lot of young ones, explained Wendy, who is now quite an authority. Because, you see, when a new baby laughs for the first time, a new fairy is born. And as there are always new babies, there will always be new fairies. I shall have such fun. It will be rather lonely in the evening, sitting by the fire. I shall have Tink. Tink can't go a twentieth part of the way round. She reminded him a little tartly. It doesn't matter. Peter, you know it matters. Well, then come with me to the little house. May I, Mummy? Certainly not. I have got you home again and I mean to keep you. But he does so need a mother. So do you, my love. Mrs Darling saw his mouth twitch and she made this handsome offer to let Wendy go to him for a week every year to do his spring cleaning. Wendy would have preferred a more permanent arrangement and it seemed to her that spring would be a long time in coming. But this promise sent Peter away quite happy again. You won't forget me, Peter, will you, before spring cleaning time comes? Of course, Peter promised. And then he flew away. He took Mrs Darling's kiss with him. Of course, all the boys went to school. Soon they settled down to being as ordinary as you or me. 
at first, Nana tied their feet to the bedpost so they would not fly away in the night. By and by, they ceased to target their bonds in bed. In time, they could not even fly after their hats. Want of practice, they called it. But it really meant that they no longer believed. Michael believed longer than the other boys, so he was with Wendy when Peter came for her at the end of the first year. She flew away with Peter in the frock she had woven from leaves and berries in the Neverland. She had looked forward to thrilling talks with him about old times, but new adventures had crowded the old ones from his mind. Who is Captain Hook? Peter asked with interest when she spoke of the arch enemy. But don't you remember how you killed him and saved all our lives? I forget them after I kill them. When she expressed a doubtful hope that Tinkerbell would be glad to see her, he said, Who is Tinkerbell? Oh, Peter! Wendy said, shocked. But even when she explained, he could not remember. There are such a lot of them. I expect she's no more. Next year, he did not come for her. She waited in a new frock because the old one simply would not meet. But he never came. Perhaps he's ill. You know he's never ill. <laughs> Perhaps there's no such person, Wendy. Peter came next to spring cleaning. And the strange thing was that he never knew he'd missed a year. That was the last time the girl Wendy ever saw him. For a little longer, she tried for his sake not to have growing pains. The years came and went without bringing the careless boy. And when they met again, Wendy was a married woman. And Peter was no more to her than a little dust in the box in which she had kept her toys. Wendy was grown up. You need not be sorry for her. She was one of the kind that likes to grow up. All the boys were grown up and done for by this time, so it's scarcely worth saying that anything more about them. You may see Nibs and Curly any day going to an office, each carrying a little bag and an umbrella. Michael is an engine driver. Slightly married a lady of title, so he became a lord. You see that judge in a wig coming out of the iron door? That used to be Tootles. The bearded man who doesn't know any story to tell his children was once John. Wendy was married in white with a pink sash. It's strange to think that Peter did not alight in the church and forbid the bands. Years rolled on again and Wendy had a daughter. She was called Jane and always had an odd inquiring look. As if from the moment she arrived on the mainland, she wanted to ask questions. When she was old enough to ask them, they were mostly about Peter Pan. She loved to hear of Peter, and Wendy told her all she could remember in the very nursery from which the famous flight had taken place. It was Jane's nursery now. Once a week, Jane's nurse had her evening off, and then it was Wendy's turn to put Jane to bed. That was the time for stories. It was Jane's invention to raise the sheet over her mother's head and her own, thus making a tent, and in the awful darkness to whisper. What do we see now? I don't think I see anything tonight. Yes, you do. You see when you were a little girl. Oh, that is a long time ago, sweetheart. Oh me, how time flies. Does it fly? The way you flew when you were a little girl. The way I flew? Do you know, Jane, I sometimes wonder whether I ever did really fly. Yes, you did. Why can't you fly now, Mother? Because I'm grown up, dearest. When people grow up, they forget the way. They are now embarked on the great adventure of the night when Peter flew in looking for his shadow. The last thing he ever said to me was, just always be waiting for me, and then some night you will hear me crowing. But alas, he forgot all about me. Wendy said it with a smile. She was as grown up as that. What did his crow sound like? Jane asked one evening. It was like this, Wendy said, trying to imitate Peter's crow. <laughs> no, it wasn't. It was like this. 
cock a doodle doo. Uh, she did it ever so much better than her mother. Wendy was a little startled. My darling, how can you know? I often hear it when I am sleeping. And then one night came the tragedy. It was the spring of the year and the story had been told for the night and Jane was now asleep in her bed. Wendy was sitting on the floor, very close to the fire, so as to see the darn for there was no other light in the light nursery. And while she sat darning, she heard a crow. Then the window blew open as of old, and Peter dropped in on the floor. He was exactly the same as ever, and Wendy saw at once that he still had all his first teeth. He was a little boy. And she was grown up. She huddled by the fire, not daring to move. Wendy, he said, not noticing any difference. But he was thinking chiefly of himself. And in the dim light, her white dress might have been the nightgown in which he had seen her first. Hello, Peter. She replied faintly, squeezing herself as small as possible. Hello, where's John? He asked, suddenly missing the third bed. John is not here now. Is Michael asleep? Yes, but that is not Michael, she said quickly, lest a judgment should fall on her. Hello? Is it a new one? Yes. Boy or girl? Girl. Now surely he would understand. But not a bit of it. Peter, are you expecting me to fly away with you? Of course. That's why I've come. Have you forgotten that this is spring cleaning time? She knew it was useless to say that he had let many spring type cleaning times pass. I can't come. I've forgotten how to fly. I'll teach you soon again. Oh, Peter, don't waste the fairy dust on me. She had risen, and now at last a new fear assailed him. What is it? Peter cried, shrinking. I will turn up the light, and then you can see for yourself. For almost the only time in his life that I know of, Peter was afraid. Don't turn up the light. She let her hands play in the hair of the tragic boy. She was not a little girl broken hearted about him. She was a grown woman smiling at it all. But they were wet eyed smiles. Then she turned up the light and Peter saw. <gasps> he gave a cry of pain. And when the tall, beautiful creature stooped to lift him in her arms, he drew back sharply. I am old, Peter. I'm ever so much more than 20. I grew up long ago. You promise not to? I couldn't help it. I'm a married woman, Peter. No, you're not. Yes. And the little girl in the bed is my baby. No, she's not. He supposed she was. And he took a step toward the sleeping child with his dagger upraised. Of course, he did not strike. He sat down on the floor instead and sobbed. And Wendy did not know how to comfort him, although she could have done it easily once. She was only a woman now, and she ran out of the room to try to think. Peter continued to cry, and soon his sobs woke Jane. She sat up in bed and was interested at once. Why? Well, why are you crying? Peter rose and bowed to her, and she bowed to him from the bed. Hello? Hello? My name is Peter Pan. <laughs> yes, I know. I came back from my mother to take her to the Neverland. Yes, I know. I have been waiting for you. When Wendy returned, diffidently, she found Peter sitting on the bedpost, crowing gloriously while Jane in her nighty was flying round the room in solemn ecstasy. She's my mother, Peter explained, and Jane descended and stood by his side. He does so need a mother. Yes, I know. No one knows it so well as I. Uh, uh, Wendy admitted rather forlornly. Goodbye. And he rose in the air, and the shameless Jane rose with him. It was already her easiest way of moving about. Wendy rushed to the window. No, no! It is just for spring cleaning time. 
He wants me always to do his spring cleaning. If only I could go with you. You see, you can't fly. Of course, in the end, Wendy let them fly away together. One last glimpse of her shows her at the window, watching them receding into the sky until they were as small as stars. As you look at Wendy, you may see her hair becoming white and her figure little again. For all this happened long ago. Jane is now a common grown-up with a daughter called Margaret. And every spring cleaning time... Except when he forgets. Peter comes for Margaret and takes her to the Neverland, where she tells him stories about himself. Uh, to which he listens eagerly. When Margaret grows up, she will have a daughter who is to be Peter's mother in turn. And thus it will go on, so long as children are happy and innocent and heartless. <laughs>